Welcome to Animology, a podcast about language, the animal-related words and expressions we use every day, and how these words shape and reflect our relationship with animals. My name is Colleen patrick Adreau, and I'm your host. You can find me at ColleenPatrickAudreau.com, also on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And be sure to subscribe to Animology at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And of course, please leave a review and a rating. Word of mouth is the best way to increase its listenership and supporting it is the best way to keep it going. So go to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau to leave a tip in the jar. Today's episode is animal words with no animal origins. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. As you know, Animology Podcast is all about the animal-related words and expressions we use. And the idea behind this podcast is to shine a light on the language we use about animals that reflects our compassion for them, our connection with them, but that also reflects a violence towards them and our exploitation of them. Being mindful about our language affects and reflects our relationship with other animals. And I know many of you listeners are interested in making sure that our expressions and words don't reflect violence. When it comes to the violent expressions, in particular, of course, I always offer compassionate versions such as cut two carrots with one knife or hit two cans with one stone instead of kill two birds with one stone. And uh, there's more than one way to peel a potato rather than there's more than one way to skin a cat, for instance. But of course, not every phrase or proverb or expression or idiom that has animals in it needs to be replaced. The bee's knees is a perfectly adorable phrase. Walking on eggs has nothing to do with exploiting animals, in my opinion. Of course, you don't want to step on the eggs of whatever bird, whether they're robin's eggs or quail's eggs or chicken's eggs. And some words that contain animals, surprisingly, don't have anything to do with animals at all. And that's what we're going to discuss today. There are a lot of fun, compassionate versions to the violent versions of idioms and expressions we've grown up with. But as I said, I don't think all of them need alternatives because not all of them have to do with animals. And some of them are simply innocuous. But I thought it would be fun to explore the origin of these words and phrases so you have a little backstory. Let's start with a very common word. It's a compound word, piggyback. I know a lot of sensitive and compassionate people want an alternative to piggyback. And for non-native English speakers, and frankly to native English speakers as well, piggyback may sound like a funny word, especially when you visualize it. Is it a pig carrying someone else on his back? Are you carrying a pig on your back? What's going on? Well, the word piggyback has absolutely nothing to do with pigs. And it's just another example of the fluidity of the English language, how words change according to, well, according to what it feels like when certain words roll off our tongue. And piggyback is one of those fun words to say, evolving specifically because it's fun to say. Let me explain. First of all, I love the word piggy. (laughs) Everyone loves the word piggy. Uh, But the meaning of piggyback is to ride on the back and shoulders of another person, right? That's the meaning of piggyback. Of course, that's very literal, as in the sentence, the little girl too tired to walk anymore asked her father if he would give her a piggyback. It could also mean to ride on top of a vehicle, building, or even a flat car of a truck or railroad, which is a later use of the word. You can also use it in a more figurative sense, such as to build upon or take advantage of someone else's efforts or past success, as in the sentence, yesterday's experiment piggybacks on previous trials. The word piggyback is now a compound word, but it began its life as two separate words, which were pick, P-I-C-K, and pack, P-A-C-K, pick, pack. Since its earliest recorded documentation in the 16th century, the exact date is not known, but it was sometime in the 16th century, it has had several variations over the years, including a pick pack, pick a pack, pick a back and pig a back. 
The Oxford English Dictionary cites pick pack and pick back within a year of each other in the 1560s, both in essays on religious themes. You have the first one by John Rastel uh, in a sermon called A Confutation of a Sermon Pronounced by Mr. Jewell. And you might be able to find a copy of that if you're interested in reading that. That was in 1564. And then in 1565, we have James Caffhill's An Answer to John Marshall's Treatise of the Cross. So you can possibly read that too. It's from 1565. And that sentence was, To easy is that way to heaven, whereto we may be carried a pickback on a road, on a horse. The pick part of these expressions derives from the word pitching, P-I-T-C-H-I-N-G, either in the sense of placing, as in pitching a tent, or in the sense of throwing, as with pitchfork. So that's the pick part. Uh, It has to do with placing or throwing. Pack and back, as in pick pack or pick a back, refer to the load, the pack, and the location of the body it's carried on, the back. So pick pack becomes pick back, and it's clear that in this context, pick pack and pick back are effectively the same expression. Now, how did pigs get involved? Well, it appears to be no more than a variation on the phrase, pick a pack evolved to pick a back, and that evolved to pick back. And by 1736, we see evidence of pig back, and then piggyback arrives in 1843. So you can see how it evolved. Just listen to me say it. Pick pack, pick a pack, pick a back, pick bag, piggyback. It just evolves naturally uh, in terms of how we form these words together. It evolves naturally to piggyback. And so there we have it. The term piggyback comes to refer to people carrying a pack on their back in the 19th century. And by the 1930s, the definition further progressed to describe riding on someone's back and shoulders. That was the most recent development of the expression. And who knows, maybe 100 years from now, there may be more developments. But as it is today, the derivation of the word piggyback has nothing to do with porcine animals at all. No pigs, were harmed in the forming of this word. Round robin is another expression most people understandably assume has to do with robins, as in the red-breasted bird, but it has nothing to do with robins at all. The meaning of the phrase is mostly related to sports, but it can pertain to other games as well. A round robin is a contest, it's a tournament, or a game in which each contestant is matched in turn against every other contestant. It basically denotes something that goes around, as in a letter or petition that gets circulated around, where each person in turn makes comments or signs the document. Now obscure, in the 17th century, it also referred to a type of a small ruff, a collar on a piece of clothing that was also called a round robin. Round robin also once described a rim or plate designed to prevent dirt from affecting the movement of a carriage axle. That meaning is now obsolete. It also referred to a loop of rubber through which passes a pole or a spring or other part of a carriage and by which it is suspended also obsolete. In Devon, England, in the 19th century, now obscure, a round robin was a small pancake. And it had many other meanings and allusions, all of which are now either regional or obsolete completely, but none of them had anything to do with the red-breasted bird that I particularly love seeing and hearing in my garden. So the meaning of round robin as in a round robin letter, like a chain letter that gets passed around and signed in turn by each person, dates back to the 19th century, around 1871. The meaning related to a tournament, like a round robin tournament, appears in print around 1894. Of course, that means that it was in use uh, orally before it was documented in print. So you can see both of them are around the 19th century. The sense of a letter may come from an older nautical term referring to a document that would have been signed by mutineers. 
In a round robin document, the mutineers would sign their names in a circle so the authorities could not identify who was the first to sign, who, you know, who would indicate who the ringleaders were. So there's a quote from 1730 from the Weekly Journal, January 1730. It says, a round robin is a name given by seamen to an instrument on which they signed their names round in a circle to prevent the ringleader being discovered by it if found. There is speculation that the robin in this phrase is a corruption of the French word ruban, meaning ribbon, which would have been used to secure the petition, most likely to roll it up and secure it. But unfortunately, there's no evidence of this. It's merely conjecture. It's likely that it's just a playful way to express this phenomenon. Playful because of the alliteration. I, for one, am a huge fan of alliteration, probably to a fault. And that is most likely the origins of and the reasoning behind having Robin paired with round, round Robin, the alliteration, the playfulness, the way it feels and sounds when you say it. But it's certain that it has nothing to do with the bird. What I do know for sure is that you are the reason this podcast exists. So I want to take a moment to thank all of you listeners, all of you subscribers, and all of you supporters, including our platinum supporters, Morgan Hall, David Cabrera, Alexander Gray, Michal Stone, Tim Anderson, Jennifer Ellis, and Ben Ellis, Sylvie Raquel, Gwen Mayo, Ulrich, and Renee Marinkovich. Remember, supporters at $10 and above receive written transcripts to every Food for Thought episode, my other podcast, and to every animal episode. So if you're getting anything out of either podcast or my work in general, consider becoming a supporter today. Visit patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau or just go to Colleen Patrick Goudreau.com and click on the donate button. Another term we use frequently that has a monkey in its name, but not a monkey in its roots is monkey wrench. Now, I suspect you know what a monkey wrench is. It's a hand tool with adjustable jaws for turning nuts of varying sizes, but it has a figurative meaning as well. That's pretty common. It's basically something that disrupts something else, like uh, something that disrupts a plan or a procedure, as in the rain threw a monkey wrench into our outdoor party plans. These days, I think it's developing more into just wrench. It's very common for people to just say, oh, you just threw a wrench in my plans. But monkey wrench is also common, and that was kind of the original phrase. This term for a wrench with an adjustable jaw dates to the early 19th century, and it's originally British, although now it's chiefly North American in usage. The sense of throwing a monkey wrench into the machinery or to interfere or cause trouble or confusion is recorded as far back as 1907 in the Chicago Tribune. But of course, always remember that words and phrases exist in the common vernacular before they appear in print. So it's likely the phrase was in use a bit before 1907. Now, unfortunately, like with Round Robin, we have no evidence of its exact origins, whether having to do with the literal tool or the figurative expression. But as with all words without a past, there has been much conjecture and a good number of apocryphal stories. Here's what the writer uh, at Worldwide Words has to say about these many theories. Quote, A contributor to American Speech in 1930 pointed out that a precursor to the device a century earlier was called a key wrench and suggested that its successor was at first called the non-key wrench. In 1931, another writer in the same journal noted that he had years ago read an account to the effect that this useful tool was invented by an English man named Monk. M-O-N-K. Around 1932, 1933, a report appeared in the transcript of Boston asserting that an American by the name of Monk, employed by Bemis and Call of Springfield, Massachusetts, invented the device, which became known by his name, Monk Wrench. One of the editors at the Oxford English Dictionary tells me that they have in their files a letter dated as early as 1893 expressing skepticism about such theories. He also points out that the tool is referred to as a monkey wrench years before suggestions of an origin in a proper name appeared. 
All such suggestions come without evidence to support them. Despite much searching in early tool catalogs and patents, no specialist researcher has been able to find any link to a named person. Indeed, the tool wasn't invented from scratch, but was an early 19th century refinement of one from the 18th century that historians of tool making call a carriage wrench. So we have to assume that all these stories linking its name to a person, monk wrench, are hearsay or folk etymology. So if you see that theory, if you see it getting passed around, you can just say there's no evidence for that whatsoever. The term monkey has been used for a variety of devices from cannons to pile drivers. And it seems likely that the wrench's name is related to this usage but exactly how is not certain. What is certain is that it doesn't have anything to do with monkeys. So while monkeys neither offend nor are offended by this phrase, I am not either. I have no problem using this phrase in my compassionate lexicon. Now, when I was a wee lass growing up in New Jersey, my favorite subject in school, if indeed it was a subject, which I think it was in my younger years, was spelling. I love D spelling. I know it's weird, but I do. I love, I still love spelling. I have a very visual mind. So if I meet someone, for instance, and they say their name, I ask them to spell it so that I can see the letters spelled in my head and it just helps me. So I've always loved spelling and I always loved spelling bees. And I remember being like seven years old and winning a spelling bee with the word squirrel. I remember that. I wasn't uh, into sports. I wasn't on any teams for sports, but I really loved the spelling bee sport. (laughs) So I'm very proud, very proud of having won that spelling bee when I was seven years old for the word squirrel. It's probably the last thing I won. But did you know that spelling bees... And other group activities you've most likely heard of, quilting bees and sewing bees, have nothing to do with busy little bees. There's been a long-held but mistaken belief that bee in these phrases refers to the social nature of a beehive and all the buzzing that takes place within, but it ain't so. The term bee has been used in the United States with the meaning of gathering, either for work pleasure, or competition since the mid-18th century. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the first usage was the name spinning bee, as in this example from the Boston Gazette in in 1769. Last Thursday, about 20 young ladies met at the house of Mr. L on purpose for a spinning match, or what is called in the country a bee. But B in this sense is derived from the Old English ben, meaning a prayer or a favor, and evolved into the Middle English word bene, from which we derive words like benefit and benediction. This migrated to boon with the meaning of a favor granted. According to the English dialect dictionary in 1905, there's the country term boon, B-O-O-N, as meaning voluntary help given to a farmer by his neighbors, especially in time of harvest. By the late 18th century, B had become commonly associated with this British dialect form, referring to the joining of neighbors to work on a single activity to help a neighbor in need, like sewing B, quilting B. And according to the website, the phrase find or this is how it happened. Migrants from England to the U.S. would have taken the term boon, which was also spelled B-E-E-N or B-E-A-N. Communal activities were an essential ingredient of survival in frontier America. So you can see how the word boon to refer to neighbors helping each other out, boon, bean would have evolved to be. The imagery of the social uh, and industrious nature of bees is possibly what changed it from bean to bee, uh, but that association was secondary or 
tertiary uh, to the origin of the word in this context. So again, it's kind of more of an evolution of just the pronunciation of the word that then became B and it stuck. And it probably stuck because people started associating that word B with the social activity of bees. Many of the activities where people congregated to undertake communal work became known as bees of one sort or another. You have husking bees, quilting bees, barn raising bees, apple bees, logging bees. Shockingly, there were even hanging bees and lynching bees. According to the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, there's a mention of an incident in Maysville, Indiana, in which a case of mistaken identity almost resulted in a lynching. It was reported in the Fort Wayne Weekly Sentinel in August 1874, and he came very near being the chief attraction at a lynching bee. So bee just referred to the, a gathering of people, but we do associate the word bee, I think, with positive things and productive things, not cruel things like lynching. So hearing it together, I Fields feels like a real oxymoron. And in 1884, Harper's Magazine wrote about an execution. This execution in Idaho phrase was a hanging bee. Spelling bee appears to be an American term that first appeared in print in 1875, but most certainly would have been used in oral communication years before then. None of which have anything to do with bees. And yet, I still like thinking about busy little social bees gathering together for the work that they're doing, and we do tend to think about that now. But the origin of the word has nothing to do with our apian brethren. Now, have you ever had a nightmare? Have you ever thought about why we have daydreams but nightmares? We don't have daymares. We don't have night dreams. We don't call it that, at least. Have you ever thought that the mare... In nightmare has to do with horses, as in mares, like which today means female horses. Well, some folks do think this, and they would be wrong to think so, although you can understand why they think that. The mare in nightmare is in fact pretty old. It comes from a Proto-Germanic word, maron, uh, M-A-R-O-N, meaning goblin, which is also the source of Middle Low German Mar, Middle Dutch Mare, Old High German Mara, and German Mar, all of which have the meaning of incubus, demon. An incubus is basically a demon, an imaginary demon credited with causing nightmares. And in male form, an incubus apparently consorts with women in their sleep. Uh, this comes from about 1200, comes from late Latin incubus. If you can imagine this demon, this incubus, sitting on a sleeper's chest, you've, you've seen artistic uh, depictions of this, uh, you can see the relationship between the word incubus and incubate, which literally means sitting on eggs to hatch them. So an incubus, a demon, sits on the sleeper and infiltrates their mind with dark demonic thoughts, as does the word mar, mara, mar. Uh, it too is a demon, Mare, uh, that sits upon the chest of the sleeper, creating dark, distorted, monstrous dreams. The Oxford English Dictionary traces the first use of nightmare in English to around 1300, so it goes back pretty far, as a female spirit or monster supposed to settle on and produce a feeling of suffocation in a sleeping person or animal. So nightmare comes from an old German word that means demon. It doesn't share a root with the word for horse, but you could see why people think that. And finally, we have the phrase pony up, which is a North American expression that means pay the money you owe, pony up. It's getting a little obscure at this point, but it still exists. And it has absolutely nothing to do with ponies, ponies being small, adorable horses, of course. The first use of pony up in print is in the Connecticut publication, The Rural Magazine, in May of 1819. It's most likely that the expression was coined in the U.S., but a claim can also be made for a British origin. Pony Up was recorded in the UK in the 19th century in Thomas Darlington's glossary Folk Speech of South Cheshire, in which he wrote in 1887. And he says in this dictionary, pony to pay. To pony out means to stump out. It's a slang term. 
But that's much later than the recording of the first American usage. However, who knows? As I've said a number of times, expressions are in the vernacular long before they make their way into print, especially if it's slang. But still, it's unlikely that the term pony up migrated to Cheshire from the U.S. because migrations of people and language were largely going in the other direction at that time. And people certainly weren't as mobile as they are today, so they wouldn't have been going back and forth as much as we would do today. Whatever the location of the first use, it's clear from the pay money meaning of pony up that the pony in question is some form of currency or donation, not an equine animal. At one time, pony was British slang for 25 pounds. So that's a possible derivation, but it's so specific an amount. And pony up means to cough up any amount, not just 25 pounds or the equivalent thereof. In fact, none of the numerous meanings of pony appear to fit the bill, but none have to do with a horse. One last possibility is this. March 25th, the English quarter day, was the day that debts were settled and payments were made. The first two words of the fifth division of Psalm 119, which was always sung at Matins, uh, that's the morning prayer, on the 25th day of the month, are legum pone. The term became associated with the payment of debts and was used as an elusive expression for payment of money, cash down. That meaning of legum pone, you can see how that Latin term pone uh, was recorded as early as 1570. So some people speculate that the source of the term pony up was the expression and spelling pone up. Pone being that Latin word. As usual, the true answer may never be known, but that's what some people will say. So there's really no way to to know, but we know that it doesn't have to do with horses. Now, just for fun and to wrap up these linguistic hijinks, in the 1950s, pony was adopted as cockney rhyming slang for rubbish, nonsense. But this doesn't seem to be related to pony up. It's worth mentioning pony and trap, because I was going to include this on the list. Pony and trap is an expression that's used. It's mostly a British expression, but I felt it was too obscure uh, to mention, to make at least one of our, our, our words or expressions that don't have anything to do with animals. But I still think it's fun, and I think you'll appreciate it, especially since you're language folks. So here it is. The expression pony as a word for rubbish is a shortened version of the full version of the Cockney rhyming slang word for crap. The full version of the rhyme is pony and trap, trap rhyming with crap. And that's how rhyming slang works. Personally, I'm rubbish at it. Or should I say I'm pony and trap at it? Or should I just say I'm pony at it? So Because this is how it works. Rhyming slang is a form of English slang, which originated in the East End of London, which is one of the reasons it's often called Cockney rhyming slang. It developed as a way of obscuring the meaning of sentences to those who didn't understand the slang, though it remains a matter of speculation whether this was a linguistic accident or whether it was developed intentionally to assist criminals or to maintain a particular community. It's kind of like Pig Latin. So if you don't know how to parse out Pig Latin or rhyming slang, you don't know what the speaker is talking about. And here's how it works. Rhyming slang phrases are derived from taking an expression which rhymes with the word that you're looking to replace, and then using that expression instead of the word. For example, the word look rhymes with butcher's hook. In many cases, the rhyming word is omitted. So hook is omitted, even though that's the one that rhymes with look. So you won't find too many Londoners having a butcher's hook at a particular site, but you would find people having a butcher's, like to have a butcher's through this telescope. So instead of gravy which is the word you're trying to replace with rhyming slang, you'd say pass the army, would you? And that comes from army and navy. Navy rhymes with gravy, and then it's dropped so that you use army 
in place of gravy. Bees and honey is rhyming slang for money, but you would just say something like hand over the bees, B-E-E-S, because you drop honey, which is what rhymes with money, and you use bees as a stand-in for both bees and honey, right? Do you get it? So hand over the bees is hand over the money. And perhaps a more common one you may have heard of is loaf for head, as in use your loaf, because loaf of bread rhymes with head. So use your loaf means use your head. The rhyming word is not always omitted, so Cockney expressions can vary in their construction, and it's simply a matter of convention which version is used. But it's super fun, especially once you get the hang of it. So pony, meaning crap, uh, comes about because pony and trap was the original expression, and trap rhymes with crap, but you get rid of the trap and you just say pony. Now, pony and trap is a real thing. A trap is a light, it was like a sporty two-wheeled or sometimes four-wheeled horse and pony-drawn carriage. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about an expression, pony and trap, that turned into uh, the rhyming slang um, for, um, for, for crap, for rubbish. So it's a, little, it's a little different there, but pony and trap actually was an actual uh, horse-drawn or pony-drawn carriage. If there are other expressions that you're curious about, whether you're curious about them having to do with animals or not, or you know some that seem to be from animals but aren't, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. You can, of course, contact me directly through ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com, or you can follow me on any of the social media accounts like Twitter or Facebook, and you can ask your questions directly. Of course, I'd love to see your comments directly on the show notes for today's episode at ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com or animologypodcast.com. Just forwards right to the page for this episode. So be sure to subscribe to Animology. Be sure to share Animology. And of course, thank you for supporting Animology for the animals. This is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Thank you for listening to Animology, changing the way we talk and think about other animals.